Welcome everybody to tonight's book talk. My name is Dr. Susan Morgan and I'm a teacher of creative writing at Cardiff University, as well as the current coordinator of Cardiff Book Talk. And it's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's event. I'm really looking forward to what promises to be a fascinating evening of talks and discussion. As you know, tonight we're going to be talking about Watership Down by Richard Adams. Published in 1972, it went on to win both the Carnegie Medal and the Guardian Children's Fiction Prize, after which it rapidly became a worldwide bestseller, being described in a review at the time as a story about rabbits, 413 pages long, that holds a reader riveted. The suggestion being that its author did this by establishing a more than plausible and totally fascinating psychology and physiology for its animal characters, together with their own mythology and language. Now, Adams had very strong views about what is now known as children's literature, which you can hear him talking about in an episode of Desert Island Discs recorded in 1977. When Roy Plumley rashly calls Watership Down a children's adventure story, Adam corrects him very crisply by denying there is such a thing as a children's storybook. He goes on to explain that his aim when writing Watership Down was to treat the child reader as a potential adult reader and to deliberately incorporate demanding difficult passages to encourage them to get their teeth into great literature later on. He thought it was only right that such a novel should contain moments of horror as well as adventure and daring do. And so it does, as a band of rabbits flee the home warren after one of them has a vision of its destruction by the machines of men. Pursued by former friends and terrorised by predators, they endure an epic journey across England's not so pleasant land, where is their resourcefulness and courage attested to the limits. Born in 1920 in a village south of Newbury, Richard Adams was the son of a country doctor after boarding school at Bradfield, Berkshire, he was accepted by Worcester College, Oxford, where his studies were interrupted by the war. In his words, serving in the army meant that he traveled widely and never fired a gun at a German. Completing his degree in history in 1948, he went into the civil service with no real ambition, he said, at that time to write. It was when he was persuaded by his daughters to write down stories he told them to while away long hours during car journeys that Watership Down came into being. It took him 18 months to write, two years to top and tail, as he put it, and one year to find a publisher. To discuss the relevance of this book, 51 years after its publication, we have a stellar panel of expert speakers. Dr. Catherine Butler, reader in English literature at Cardiff University, author of countless academic books about which more later, as well as six novels for children and teenagers. Dr. Dimitra Femi, senior lecturer in fantasy and children's literature at the University of Glasgow and co-director director of the wonderfully named Centre for Fantasy and the Fantastic. And Dr. Lisa Sainsbury, associate professor in children's literature at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Roehampton series editor for Bloomsbury's Perspectives on Children's Literature and director of the National Centre for Research in Children's Literature. Each of our three speakers will present a 15 to 20 minute paper on Watership Down, after which they will be happy to answer audience questions and take part in further discussion. Please post your questions in the Q&A box, which you should be able to see on your screen. Or if you use the chat, please make sure you select to all attendees and then everyone can see it and it can be part of a discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the night, Dr. Catherine Butler. Hello, thank you very much for that introduction, Susan. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk, I guess, about empathy and I hope I can beg your empathy as I attempt to share my screen. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. 
Is that visible? Uh, just like yeah. a knock or two. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So this talk is called Humans Are So Rabbit, Watership Down and Theory of Mind. And it's really just a way of talking about you know, one of my residual bugbears when I'm reading about animals in children's fiction or indeed in any fiction, but it does tend to be children's fiction, which is to what extent should we think of these characters as being human or quasi-human or other than human? How do we actually interpret them? So that's my kind of underlying question. And I hope that it can be a way of putting Watership down in some perspective as one obviously in a long series um, of children's books that feature animal characters in a prominent role. Uh, obviously a, a, particular, a particularly important example. So I'm going to start with a quotation from R. M. Lockley's The Secret Life of Rabbits, which is um, it was it was an extremely important inf and influential book uh, for for Richard Adams, um, and I'm going to give you a quotation from it here. Um, to understand the mind of an animal, says Lockley, one needs at least some knowledge of the physiology of the sense of the living creature. To begin with, impressions of sight. What did the buzzard see? And what was the image in the eye of the rabbit? And how near are those perceptions to those of the human observer? Not as near as Beatrix Potter's caricatures of rabbits would suggest, but perhaps nearer than the skeptics suppose. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my face, but I'm now waving a copy of Lockley's book in front of me. Um, now this passage raises one of the mo most intractable questions regarding animals, um, whether real or fictional. You know, how far can or should one attribute to them a consciousness that's comparable to that of human beings in terms of self-awareness, the ability to observe, to infer, to decide, to speculate, or to imagine, or to use some form of language or language equivalent. Rabbits and humans are both mammals, obviously, and there seems little reason apart from dogmatic exceptionalism to suppose that we are entirely unique in the abilities I've just mentioned. However, questions of degree are harder to settle. So Lockley, uh, suggests that there's a range of possibilities and asks where rabbits sit on that range, further away than Beatrix Potter's creations, perhaps, which are quite anthropomorphized, but perhaps not as far as some might imagine or desire. So we could come up with, a, I did come up with a very crude uh, kind of diagram here, a sort of scale of consciousness, which has at the top, perhaps something like a tree, um, then going down to a crab, maybe a rabbit somewhere in the middle, then a dog, a chimpanzee, and a beautifully drawn human right at the bottom. Um, now, this kind of scale of consciousness is, of course, rather crude, um, and it can too, too easily replicate the old idea of the great chain of being. Um, a kind of teleological progression from Australopithecus, from Homo sapiens, or from trees to human beings, showing human beings very much at the pinnacle, or in, in, at the bottom here, um, of creation or evolution according to taste. Even so, the idea that animal minds might resemble our own to a greater or lesser extent is very plausible, um, and it has implications and here we come to the point, I suppose, it has implications for the way that fiction can be written about animals. So when we think about animals, not just in reality, but also in fiction, we could perhaps set out a sort of similar scale showing greater or lesser degrees of anthropomorphism. So 
um, you know, this isn't a, a complete or necessarily reliable list, but I think it just gives an impression. Uh, going down from White Fang, maybe Watership Down would be next. The Tale of Peter Rabbit, Wind in the Willows, Arthur the Aardvark. Um, so, you know, Art, White Fang is a more realistic book than the others in that the protagonist does not, for example, use language, let alone wear clothes or mess about in boats, such as we find at the other end of the scale with you know, Mole and Ratty in The Wind in the Willows or Arthur and his uh, school chums in Arthur the Aardvark, who essentially live human lives in all but name. Now, we might wish that or expect that we could we could match this rich variety uh, of fictional representations of animals with a, a kind of equally graduated series of reading positions so that we would read White Fang in one way, Watership Down in another, Tale of Peter Abbott in a third, and so on. But what I would like to suggest is that in reality, most readers only have kind of two settings for reading about animals. Either we can read them as humans in light disguise, or we read them as, in some sense, sort of irretrievably other. Now, intermediate positions are possible, but they're difficult to establish. And I suggest that they are also sort of inherently unstable, perhaps because of some quirk of human psychology. They're likely to collapse into one or other of these two options, either quasi-human or something quite alien. Rather like when we look at a gestalt figure, and of course I chose the one with a rabbit in it, um, we might see this picture as a picture of a duck, or we might see it as a picture of a rabbit. But it's very difficult to look at it and see both at the same time. And I think that when we're reading about animals in fiction, we often get a similar effect. We can see them as sort of human, or we can see them as quite alien, but it's difficult to see them as both at the same time, and it's difficult to see them as anything in between. However, um, where Richard Adams comes into this is that I think he's done more than most to attempt to scrape out some kind of space where an intermediate interspecies empathy identification indeed can be found. Now, I want to Give some context for Richard Adams in this respect by just looking briefly at a couple of other writers. Um, so let's take Kenneth Graham in The Wind and the Willows. Uh, I would say that he is sort of shamelessly inconsistent in his portrayal of Mole and Ratty and Toad and the Badger in The Wind and the Willows. His characters are, of course, in most respects, portrayed as Edwardian gentlemen. And they live accordingly, wearing clothes, speaking, eating human food, um, and in Toad's case, also driving cars and living in a stately home. However, there are times when the mismatch between human lives and those of woodland creatures is brought into sharp relief and even maybe highlighted for comic effect. And I'm going to give you as an example of this, not the only one, Toad's encounters with the jailer's daughter whose words to her father shows, show that she sees the toad entirely as an animal. You know how fond of animals I am, she says to her father. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. So here she's talking about toad as if he were simply a, an animal creature that she might be able to train to do very simple tricks. But when we see her from Toad's point of view, we get a comically different perception. Toad, of course, in his vanity, thought that her interest in him proceeded from a growing, a growing tenderness. And he could not help half regretting that the social gulf between them was so very wide, for she was a comely lass and evidently admired him very much. So there's no middle ground between being a realistic Toad uh, and a member of the gentry. And in the reader's mind, we kind of flip from one perspective to the other, rabbit to duck, duck to rabbit. And Grimm, of course, in this passage and in others, takes advantage of that for the purpose of humour. 
so let's also think about Beatrix Potter, who was named by Lockley, as you'll remember, <clears throat> as producing, quote, caricatures of rabbits. And she's an interesting case because Potter was, in fact, a highly skilled, skilled naturalist and artist and a keen observer of both wild and domestic rabbits. And her realistic sketches are exquisite, as I, I think, I hope you'll agree. Now, Potter's tale of Peter Rabbit is usually seen as very much at the anthropomorphic scale of things, end, end of the scale. Um, the story, of course, tells of young Peter's misadventures in Mr. McGregor's vegetable garden, and um, he's visited there despite being warned off by his mother. And you can see this as a straightforward kind of parable or allegory about the advisability of young children heeding parental warnings. And in this view, Peter is a boy substitute. He has a boy's name, of course, he's dressed in a blue jacket, and his behaviour is constructed as that of a naughty, easily distracted child who's sent to bed without supper in the end. But at the same time, Peter is a wild young rabbit, vulnerable to being cooked and eaten, prey to cats and irate gardeners. The domesticity of the scenes in Potter's, Potter's watercolours contrasts with the sense that this world of picturesque cotton cottage gardens is, for Peter, threatening and dangerous. And this is something we see again, in fact, in Watership Down, where the placid countryside of the Hampshire-Berkshire border is a landscape fraught with dangers and predators. Now, the text of Peter Rabbit, like that of Graham, from which it differs in almost every other respect, um, offers two distinct reading positions. We can either endow the rabbits with uh, character, the rabbit characters with language and human behavior, see them as speaking, wearing clothes, drinking chamomile tea, and so on. Or we can see Peter Rab exhibiting rabbit-like behavior, as in the book's first illustration, which depicts the whole family rather naturalistically in front of a burrow. But in fact, neither way of looking at the book can be entirely consistently sustained. Mr. McGregor, the gardener, or the, the owner of the garden, chases Peter as he would any other vermin. But Peter is clearly wearing a jacket and shoes, signs that mark him off as a member of human culture. And we can't pretend that Mr. McGregor doesn't see the jacket and shoes because he later uses them to make a scarecrow. So what does Mr. McGregor make of all this? The text doesn't tell us, of course, because it cannot, and perhaps dare not. And again, after Peter loses his clothes in a gooseberry net, we see this picture. Um, now, if shall we see this unclothed rabbit as a wild animal in its natural state, as we might if we were seeing it out of context? Or are we seeing it as you know, a naked child, stripped of its clothes? Both readings are kind of obligatory to understand the story, but they're both incompatible. There is no middle ground between them. So both Potter and Graham, in their different ways, use this gestalt effect, the dark rabbit effect, to surprise readers for humour or for play. Now, Richard Adams makes a more concerted attempt, I think, to find a kind of intermediate position between human and rabbit. In trying to square this circle, I suggest that he uses two main techniques. And one is to show that rabbits are not an undifferentiated mass, that there's variation between them along various axes, for example, that of intelligence. It's clear in the novel that Blackberry is the cleverest rabbit, then Fiverr, then Hazel. Certain things can be conceived of by some rabbits, but not others such as the raft that they discover earlier on. Early on. Yeah. So it floats, says Blackberry. We could put Fiverr and Pipkin on it and make it float again. It might go across the river. Can you understand? Hazel had no idea what he meant. Blackberry's flood of apparent nonsense only seemed to draw tighter the mesh of danger and bewilderment. <clears throat> so that's one example. More controversially, perhaps at times, Adams implies that there is also a variation, not only amongst rabbits, but amongst human beings. So, so human societies too have a range of 
perceptions and conceptions and styles of thinking um, and ways of interacting with nature. Rabbits, of course, have no idea of precise time or punctuality, he writes. In this respect, they are much the same as primitive people who often take several days over assembling for some purpose and then several more to get started. Before such people can act together, a kind of telepathic feeling has to th flow through them and ripen to the point where, when they all know they are ready to begin. Anyone who has seen the martins and swallows in September assembling on the telephone wires has seen at work the current that flows among creatures who think of themselves primarily as part of a group and only secondarily, if at all, as individuals, to fuse them together and impel them into action without conscious thought or will. Now, of course, the phrase primitive people has not aged well, but here Adam seems to mean by it not you know, people at a sort of earlier or less advanced stage of development, but societies with different attitudes towards community. Societies may be collectivist without being technologically undeveloped, after all. Japan is an obvious example. The ability to read unarticulated signs may be a social skill, reading the room or the air or between the lines. And in nature, it can be attunement to changes of light, temperature, sound or humidity, the presence or absence of certain kinds of vegetation, a sensitivity to direction or season. And this kind of knowledge can be acted on without conscious thought or language. And in that respect, it resembles the instinct or instinctively deployed knowledge that causes gathering swallows to twitter in the skies in September. Now in Watership Down, the P word is found in at least one other place after the rabbits hear of the fate of their former companions in their home warren. Hazel and his companions had suffered extremes of grief and horror during the telling of Holly's tale. Yet, as with primitive humans, the very strength and vividness of their sympathy brought with it a true release. The story over, the, the demands of their own hard, rough lives began to reassert themselves in their hearts, in their nerves, their blood and appetites. Would that the dead were not dead, but there is grass that must be eaten, pellets that must be chewed, cracker that must be passed, holes that must be dug, sleep that must be slept. The practical aspects limiting grief are stressed here. But in Watership Down, there's plenty to suggest a more general indifference in lapine attitudes towards the past. Rabbit seemed to use what Miachia Eliade called sacred time as opposed to the linear time that dominates contemporary Western thought. And this is reflected in the myths that are told about El Arachirea, oh, I can never pronounce that name, which appears to be set in the deep past, but assume a modern landscape in which farm machinery, for example, exists. Hazel and the rest even witnessed their own exploits being dug into the mythic soil and recycled as stories for the next generation. This sacred or mythic time might just as well be called practical time, with the useful parts of the past being repurposed as stories, and the rest, dates, places, names, being discarded like winnowed husks. So I think we could say that Adams does disrupt this human rabbit gestalt by blurring the distinctions on which it's founded you know, from both directions. But the pull of habit is always towards its reassertion. And I think we can see this in the adaptations and artwork for his book. In the 1978 animation, for example, it begins with a realistic or fairly realistic view of a wild rabbit, which shortly afterwards metamorphoses into a cartoonish version more practical to animate, but also by assimilation to previous cartoon rabbits from Bambi onwards, easier for viewers to anthropomorphize, to accept as having a quasi-human mind. And we really bridge the gap between these two depictions. Perhaps in the end, it's better to put it the other way around as Lockley did when he described the, a human as an animal that consciously and subconsciously engages much of his life in the same situation as eating to live, 
avoiding death from many and numerous sources, such as war and disease, and being killed by his enemies or by the machinery which he himself has invented. It's not the rabbits that are so human, perhaps. Rather, in Lockley's words, humans are so rabbit. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing if I can just figure out how so to do. There should be a button just at the top of the screen. Oh, there, there we go. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for raising such interesting questions about the animal and the human and their connections, notions I'm sure that we're going to discuss later. But until then, I'd like now to introduce our second speaker for tonight, Dr. Dimitri Fini, whose talk tonight is entitled The Rabbits Become Strange, Watership Down and the Literature versus folklore question. Over to you, Dimitra. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I'm going to try and share the slides. And hopefully this works. Um, oh, okay. come on. Yeah, good. Uh, can I have a quick? Oh, we can all see, hopefully you can all see this, right? Okay, so um, um, Catherine's talk just, just now set me up really nicely, especially these ideas about um, primitive people, you know, primitive people in quotation marks, I suppose, and mythical time as well. So I'm going to return to some of those ideas, but from a slightly different angle. And uh, as, as um, Catherine's talk sort of was a zoom out looking at what should down in the context of other literature that um, that uses animals in, in, in different ways and in different sort of um uh, stages of the spectrum, I'm actually going to focus on one episode, one particular episode from Watch It Down and hopefully get you to think a bit about, uh, yeah, the literature versus folklore question. So um, I'm going to quite tightly be focused in this short talk on a few chapters from Watch It Down with only a couple of small forays and brief references to other parts of the book. And the episode I will be talking about is the approach to short stay in and departure from cowslips warren uh, and all of this happens quite early on in what ship down uh, in chapters 12 to 17 so the stranger in the field hospitality like trees in november the story of the king's lettuce silverweed and the shining wire and these six chapters actually uh, conclude part one of watership down the journey so they're quite significant that they're, they're, they're brings uh, that first part to a climax now, as it has been noted before in, in Watership Down scholarship, uh, this episode of Cowslips Warren can be read as, um, if we read the text as an Aeneid or an Odyssey sort of retelling with bunnies, uh, that episode can be read as the Lotus Eaters. Um, and, and, you know, one, one of, I can't remember the name of the scholar now off the top of my head, but uh, has called this episode the Lettuce Eaters, because we have the, these, this idea of sort of the, the um, very rich sort of uh, uh, food and, and this sort of sense of, um, yeah, reluctance to act and reluctance to sort of uh, get out of a particular situation. But at the same time, this episode is a representation of an alternative rabbit society, which seems to have uh, very, very different cultural practices to Hazel and his company, but also a uh, particular and quite unrabbit-like philosophy of life. So one noticeable difference is that the rabbits in Cowslips Warren create self-conscious art, that is sculpture. Well, some sort of visual art anyway, I'll come back to that in a second. And they also create formal poetry. This is opposed to the only artistic endeavor we witness from Hazel and his group, though it has other functions too, it's not just for art, uh, the passing down of folk narratives, myths, legends, and folk tales orally from generation to generation. And to me, this distinction seems to mirror the 19th century dichotomy between civilized Western art created by named and often celebrated artists and authors and the artistic endeavors on the other side of the nameless folk, the subject of the then new discipline of folklore. So in the early decades of this discipline, the folk of folklore were understood as the illiterate peasants of Europe 
who were transmitting orally from generation to generation a great wealth of traditional stories and tales, popular ballads and other folk songs, riddles, proverbs, wise sayings, all of those things. So the work of the 19th century folklorist was to visit rural areas of his nation. And yes, it was usually a he, so his nation uh, said knowingly and collect as many folk tales, folk songs, ballads, and other such traditional material. He would then describe and classify this law and often publish it in a collection. So you will have noticed hopefully here a hierarchical and rather patronizing dichotomy between the educated scholars who studied folklore and the uneducated folk who created and maintained it. So the illiterate folk may have been perceived as a, the repository of this wealth of traditional material, but they needed the literate, educated, middle or upper class scholar to do the work of collecting and explicating the significance, the artistic value, and even the meaning of this folklore material, because the peasants themselves were just passive transmitters. They couldn't quite appreciate what this material was, why this material was so important. Now, Alan Dandis, in his influential essay, Who Are the Folk, which actually, which actually, this is where we start moving away from that idea of who the folk are in folklore, actually distinguished three categories um, of folk uh, in 19th century folkloristics, bringing also into sharp focus Europe's imperialistic uh, activity. So we have the savage of primitive folk. Again, these words are you know, very much in quotation marks today, pre or non-literate the folk or the peasants, illiterate, rural, lower stratum of society, and the civilized or elite folk, literate, urban, and the upper stratum. So as Dandis explained, and that's his words here, I'm quoting him, 19th century usages of the term folk lay in, fact that it lay in the fact that it was defined in contrast with or in opposition to some other population or group. The folk were understood to be a group of people who constituted the lower stratum, the so-called vulgus in populo, in contrast with the upper stratum or elite of that society. The folk were constructed on, construct, contrasted, on the other hand, with, civil, with civilization. They were the uncivilized element of a civilized society. But on the other hand, they were also contrasted with a so-called savage or primitive society, i.e. people of the remote past of the non -Euro or the non-European peoples who were the subject of colonial oppression, actually which was considered even lower on the evolutionary ladder. So the European folk of that beginning, the beginnings of the discipline of folklore were conceived as the illiterate element in literate society and the rural elements in an increasingly urban society. The folk were seen as a remnant of the primitive or savage in a literate civilized context, preserving traditional material, which could be fruitfully compared to Again, Dandis's words here, the supposedly fuller versions to be found among savage societies, unquote. Now, let's come back to what it down. Um, let's first stop and observe the clear class, dis class distinction that the text sets up between the well-fed, sleek rabbits of Cowslips Warren and the rather bedraggled sight of Hazel and his companions. So in chapter 12, when the stranger in the field, Cowslip, approaches, we get Hazel's point of view and impression. The stranger had an unusual smell, but it was certainly not unpleasant. It gave Hazel an impression of good feeding, of health and of certain indolence, as though the other came from some rich, prosperous country where he himself had never been. He had the air of an aristocrat, and as he turned to gaze at Blackberry from his great brown eyes, Hazel began to see himself as a rugged wanderer leader of a gang of vagabonds. So notice here the human parallel between an individual from the elite upper class having a certain air of wealth and Hazel's ragged company. And this opposition continues to be foregrounded in the text. Uh, Cowslip has the, later on we're told, the unhurried air of having all he wanted. And the rest of the rabbits in the warrant have the same rich opulent smell as Cowslip. This opposition also extends to the manners of those rabbits, which again seem to be mirroring elite versus peasant human social norms and stereotypes. So the first thing um, Hazel notices is that there is an unnatural gentleness in his demeanor, and he seems, though perfectly friendly, detached, almost bored. 
when Cowslip himself sees the mud-stained bedraggled rabbits of Hazel's lot, he looks at them with an air of being too polite to comment, the text tells us. And then we come to the first contact of Hazel and co with other rabbits of Cowslip's, Cowslip's Warren and uh, the formal greeting they receive in uh, the entrance. So this is as they approach. Both rabbits together made a curious dancing movement of the head and front paws. And sniffing, as Hazel and Cowslip had done when they met, formal gestures, except between mating rabbits, were unknown to Hazel and his companions. They felt mystified and slightly ill at ease. The dancers paused, evidently waiting for some acknowledgement or reciprocal gesture, but there was none. Again, we can read this scene as the equivalent of and educated peasants not understanding the posh ways of their social betters. The latter used complex conventions that the former don't seem to know or understand. But as I was as I said at the beginning, what clinches this analogy for me at least is the kind of elite art produced in Cowslip's Warren versus the folk art of Hazel's group. So when Hazel first, Hazel first encounters the shape of El Ahraira, made with stones on the human-made wall, he doesn't know what to make of it. And, and forgive me the quick parenthesis here, what is this shape exactly? You know, we, we never hear it described from a human perspective. It's always from the rabbit's perspective. So I always imagine it as some sort of image or illustration made up of small stones, because rabbits can't realistically imagine to wield a brush or a pen. But you can sort of stretch possibilities to imagine them maybe you know, push, putting stones next to each other and pushing them into the wall. You know, that comes back to what Catherine was saying before, you know, how far can we go with these things? Uh, so is it a painting cum sculpture? Is it a relief? You know, if we go with the Tate Gallery's definition, a relief is a wall-mounted sculpture in which the three-dimensional elements are raised from a flat base. That's what it sounds like. You know, they're pushed onto the wall, the, the little stones to make the shape. Anyway, back to Hazel, who plainly has no idea what the shape is. He can't appreciate what, why Strawberry values it and doesn't understand how it could possibly relate to El Fayra. How could these stones be El Fayra? He doesn't understand this idea of representation, visual representation. So when he tries to have a closer look at it, Strawberry cautions him in a rather patronizing tone, and that's the last bullet point in this uh, uh, slide. Steady, steady, said Strawberry. You might damage it, and that wouldn't do. Never mind. We'll come again some other time. So you don't get it, but that's fine. I'll just get you away from it before you destroy it. So this patronizing tone gets even stronger when Hazel overhears Strawberry talking to Cowslip after he's shown him the shape. Um, Hazel noticed that Cowslip had joined them and that Strawberry was talking to him quietly. He caught the words, never been near a shape. And a moment later, Cowslip replied, well, it makes no difference from our point of view. This last phrase can be read in many different ways once we know what's to come, which the rabbits don't know at this point, and neither the reader. Now, it's also worth pointing out that there is also a sort of, sort of um, reverse snobbery that's going on on these uh, scenes from, Haz uh, from Hazel's party, who talk rather derogatorily about these strange rabbits' ar artistic endeavors. So the lullaby that the cowslips, the cowslips Warren's rabbits sing to their young seems queer to them. Uh, Bigwig refers to these mad rabbits who probably dance in the moonlight or something. And even Pipkin notes that despite their size, these rabbits are no proper fighters. And again, uh, quote, not like Bigwick and Silver. And the value recognized here by uh, Pipkin is physical prowess versus what the other rabbits show, which is delicate elegance and tastes. But let me come back to art and the main contrast the text sets up. When invited to tell a story, Hazel's company puts forward Dandelion, their great storyteller, who tells the, the tale of El Al Fraira and the King's Lettuce. Our rabbits are naturally greatly entertained and very proud of Dandelion's skill until they're deflated by the reaction of the rabbits in Cowslip's Warren. And that's how it goes. Very nice, said Cowslip. He seemed to be searching for something more to say, but then repeated, yes, very nice, an unusual tale. But he must know it, surely, muttered Blackberry to Hazel. I always think these traditional stories contain a lot of charm, said another of the rabbits, especially when they're told in that real old-fashioned spirit. 
So Pooh Hazel here is taken aback, especially as he thought that uh, that particular El Afraira story would be a popular one, because this is the one depicted in the, in the shape, in the relief that Strawberry has shown him. But Cowslip explains, well, we don't tell the old stories very much, said Cowslip. Our stories and poems are mostly about our own lives here. Of course, the shape of Labornum that we saw, it's old fashioned now. El Afraira doesn't really mean much to us. Not that your friend's story wasn't very charming, he added hastily. And then we get a sample of what that curious Warren does value above all as art. And that's Silverwood and his beautiful and sick poem, as Fiverr calls it later, and philosophy of fine folly about dignity and acquiescence. Again, Fiverr's words. Silverwood's poem isn't just art, it seems to be part of a cult of a kind, as his ideas are described as having a great following. So the way I'm reading this main artistic battle in the text is as a contrast between elite literary art, interestingly here in verse, with rhythm and repetition and structural devices, and folk narratives, myths and legends and folk tales, which are prose narratives told for both entertainment, but also instruction, caution, and passing on religious worldviews or any other type of traditional knowledge. As Backford, and this, this is a Silver, Silverweed's uh, poem here. Um, as Backford, Backthorn says, Ella Fryer is a trickster and rabbits will always need tricks. So the rabbits in his group retain this powerful oral culture that does exactly this job of educating and passing down traditions and beliefs. But the rabbits of Cowslips Warren prefer literary, highly artistic composition. It's interesting to note again the type of patronizing language um, that. Um, they use for these folk narratives uh, of dandelions. They have charm, especially when told in that real old fashioned spirit. Even Le Bournum's El Afraira shape is old fashioned now. El Afraira doesn't really mean much to us, says uh, Cowslip. Now, Strawberry tellingly says that the shape of El Afraira, El Afraira, goodness today, sorry, El Afraira by Le Bournum is worth a visit but it's only something to admire as art, not something that can pass on any, anything worth knowing about his legendary hero on those stories and exploits Hazel's group model, their behavior and, um, and values. I think I went um, a bit forward with that, sorry, with the slides here, I oh, should be here. Um, remember how Ella Fry Rice first introduced the reader earlier on in the book as a Robin Hood or a John Henry, and the book says Odysseus himself might have borrowed a trick or two, from the rabbit hero. But the cowslips warren is, the, uh, uh, for the two cowslips warren, this is just charming, old fashioned stories. Remember again that attitude of the 19th century folklorist towards the subjects of the research with which I started. I think that one can nearly hear evidence uh, of modern Western culture's love hate relationship with myth, legend, and folktale in this episode or series of episodes at cowslips warren. Yes. We should preserve these old stories and we should certainly look after and admire their artistic, uh, the artistic works of named artists of this late, uh, less enlightened past. So Labonum's shape may be read as equivalent to, I don't know, classical Greek statues of gods and goddesses or legendary heroes, especially those uh, of, by named artists like the Her Hermes of Praxiteles. Yes, we should preserve and look after these masterpieces of a less civilized time, we surely don't believe in those stories and those heroes anymore. They're just myths. What we really want are stories and poems about ourselves and about our lives, as Cowslip asserts. Modern realistic literature, not those old fantastic tales of the folk mind. But, and here things get more complicated, nothing more interesting. What is Silverwood's highly accomplished poetry really about? And again, I've sort of highlighted a few of the uh, a few of the elements here. Um, when the premise of the existence of Cowslips Warren is finally revealed, that the rabbits are happy to exchange the chance of death by snare at any point for an easy life of luxury, then suddenly a troubling connection, I think, arises between high art and literature and death. This rabbit society's philosophical beliefs and ideological stances may be explained as stemming from the consciousness of the certainty and inevitability of death, 
and the metaphysical anxiety this knowledge causes, especially in a society that doesn't believe in myths anymore. Coupled with the rabbit's avoidance of any question, starting with where, anything that can expose the fact that anyone can be gone at any point, killed by a snare, I'm wondering whether this entire episode isn't also a reference, intended or not, to what scholars and popular commentators in the second part of the 20th century called the death taboo. Very simply put, the death taboo refers to the 20th century belief that death is so dangerous and disturbing a subject that one should not only avoid contact with the dead, uh, uh, the dying and the recently bereaved, but also refrain from talking or even thinking about it. Though influential studies like that by Ariès attributed the phenomenon of the forbidden death, the perception of death as a shameful or forbidden uh, uh, subject, to more deaths taking place in the clinical environment of hospitals rather than at home, and the modern insistence on happiness as what life should be about, other scholars, such as Meller and Schilling, added another dimension. They argued that death is so alarming in contemporary societies because modernity has deprived increasing numbers of people of the means of containing it in an overarching, existentially meaningful ritual structure. Silverwood's poem is most certainly a covert, oblique, artistic way to talk about death in a way that may seem less disturbing, but yet an attempt to give some meaning to the fate that awaits the rabbits at Cowslips Warren. As Fiver later explains, when he at least reveals to his companions what exactly it was that they, could, they couldn't quite put their fingers on or their paws on, I suppose, no one must ever ask where another rabbit was and anyone who asked where, except in a song or poem, must be silenced. To say where was bad enough, but to speak openly of the wires, that was intolerable. For that, for that, they would scratch and kill. So you can talk about it obliquely, but not, um, not openly. So, and this sounds to me like a pretty good overview of the death taboo concept indeed. Now, bringing my threads together as I head towards a, a conclusion, I have often wondered and have discussed this with my students when teaching Watchship Down, what kind of intellectual argument is being creatively tested in the Cowslip episode? Is literature about death and folklore about survival. Um, because surely Silverwood's poem is about accepting death in a secular rabbit society, if we can call it that. Well, the story of, of El Hal Raira that the lion tells are about how their rabbit hero survived danger after den danger, adventure after adventure by his tricks and resource resourcefulness and wits. They're a guide, a survival guide in many ways, not an acceptance of death. Is Adams reversing here the 19th century folkloristic perception? Are the values of a civilized secular society weighted against the more religious, spiritual folk mind of Hazel's company and found wanting? Is the text privileging folklore and the oral tradition against literary elite high art? I think in many ways it does. By putting in the center of the narrative a rabid society that emulates the folk of the 19th century and taking their side against the educated upper class, and by giving elite art and formal literature to a society we're expected to see through and pity, if not despise, I think the text comes firmly on the side of orality, traditional material, and the sense of community that they, they exist in. Having said that, of course, for this argument to stand absolutely, and I'm not claiming that it does stand absolutely, we can debate this, one needs to disregard the novel's many epigraphs, which, uh, as has been discussed many times before, mix promiscuously high literature and folklore, but also texts that bring the two together, like ancient epics, for example. But that, I guess, is a discussion for another time, or probably for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dimitra, for your talk covering folklore and literature, oral storytelling and the written word, as well as rabbit art and life and death. Um, what a talk. And we, we look forward to discussing them, all those subjects later. And please do, our audience, start to post your questions. Um, before that opportunity, I'd like to in, move on to our final speaker for, the, for tonight, um, Dr. Lisa Sainsbury, who's whose talk is entitled On the Ridge Between Bull Banks and Watership Down, Echoontology and the Negotiation of Space. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you for inviting me this evening. And I think Anna has very kindly agreed to operate my slides. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when um, I need to move on there. Uh, like Catherine, I'm interested in the conditions of anthropomorphism. And like Demetra, I, I draw attention, at least very briefly, to conditions of class in, in Watership Down. Uh, but before exploring the ridge between bull banks and Watership Down of my title, I'm going to pull together a few critical threads which help to explain what I mean by eco-ontology and the negotiation of space I see at work in Watership Down and related examples of children's literature. Anthropomorphism poses several difficulties for environmentalism, and I suggest that Watership Down offers solutions. But first, let's identify at least one of the problems. In Ecocriticism, uh, Greg Garrard explores at some length the ecological challenge of anthropomorphism. And we can move on to my first slide. Uh, Garrard points out that Conversely, while it might seem that anthropomorphism engenders kindness towards animals and acceptance for their agency, in its crude form, it is really a way of not seeing animals in their own right at all. End of quotation. Garrard explores various ways in which philosophers, scientists, authors, and so on, have addressed the question of whether anthropomorphic responses to non-human beings uh, can ever see animals and other non-human beings properly. Now, certainly naturalists such as Henry Williamson, and I have a, another slide here, um, Naturalists such as Henry Williamson have come close, but Tarka the Otter, published in 1927, is limited by its commitment to a narrative plot and character attribution that drives action through a human point of view. Garrard suggests that popular cultural forms have a strong anthropomorphic bias that sways even stories that are built to resist it, such as Tarka, which is so committed to telling a true story. So is the narrative convention of Tarka the Otter necessarily blind to the otter, in spite of Williamson's avowed commitment to truthful representation of the natural world? Is anthropomorphic literature ever able to move beyond the sort of blind helplessness accorded to Tarka and his sisters in their first 10 days of life. Indeed, I think it is possible for anthropomorphism to open a gateway that moves beyond human experience into non-human being, with the caveat that anthropomorphism is necessarily bound to the human. So how might this work? This is where the negotiation of space comes into play, along with an understanding of biotic community and land ethic in Aldo Leopold's terms. Uh, and I have another slide here. In his rather wonderful A Sand County Almanac, published in 1949, Leopold explains, and here I'm quoting, that while ethics are possibly a kind of community instinct in the making. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants and animals, or collectively the land. A land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect the community as such. End of quotation. So this idea of land ethic and biotic community is certainly identifiable in Watership Down. And I make a case for this in uh, chapter four of Ethics in British Children's Literature. 
um, if this ethical aspect of my discussion interests you, but I'm not going to talk about that now. What I want to push onto here um, is my conviction that the spatial connections in Watership Down and other works of children's literature can open a biosphere in which human and non-human being come together. Now, in order to achieve this next step from ethics to metaphysics, we need to make the sort of shift in considering space or place as described by Robert McFarlane in the old ways. And I have another slide here. So McFarlane says, we are adept at saying what we make of places, but we are far less good at saying what places make of us. For some time now, it has seemed to me that the two questions we should ask of any strong landscape are these. Firstly, what do I know when I'm in this place that I can know nowhere else? And then, vainly, what does this place know of me that I cannot know of myself? End of quotation. Now, McFarlane's questions are distinctly human. Yet McFarlane pushes in the sort of direction that Leopold requires for biotic community when he recognises that landscape can make something of those that exist within it and not vice versa. In the context of McFarlane's ontologically directed questions, it is conceivable that all kinds of beings might be made something of by the landscape in which they exist. So there are two important takeaways here, and I've put these up on another slide. First, biotic community requires the coming together of ontologically diverse beings. Second, strong landscape makes something of the beings within it. McFarlane's notion of strong landscape draws on literature and metaphor suggesting that landscapes of literary naturalism have the potential to evoke an ecologically diverse biosphere in which human being does not dominate. And this is where the ridge between bull banks and watership down comes into play. I am making a case for the importance of liminal spaces in anthropomorphic literature, in which human and non-human being becomes fluid and open to other ways of being. These spaces extend beyond individual texts and speak to a wider tradition of anthropomorphic writing in which different levels and modes of anthropomorphism see and speak to each other at the level of community. And I offer some brief examples of my thinking here. And um, um, if you'd go on to the next slide, please. Um, and you can see the, 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 the ridge map, mapped out um, between Watership Down and Hair Warren Down there. So towards the end of Watership Down, Hazel is deposited by a human child, and I quote, on the ridge between Hair Warren Down and Watership Down. Until this quite late point in Adam's novel, Human beings, that is human characters, have been an offstage looming presence that threaten the rabbits and their habitat. Though of course human experience has also been evoked throughout by the process of anthrop anthropomorphizing rabbits. The relationship between human and rabbit changes in this episode though, entitled Dea Ex Machina. The goddess from the machine turns out to be Lucy a human child in a car. Adams Riley alludes to and plays with the idea that the plot appears to have driven him and Hazel into the jaws of no return when Tab, the farm cat, captures Hazel. Human intervention is required to resolve uh, Hazel's predicament if the conditions of the novel's anthropomorphism are not to be ignored. Throughout the novel, Adams manages a really tricky balance between the requirements of a naturalism that involves fictional rabbits acting as wild rabbits might, at least according to R.M. Lockley's account in The Private Life of a Rabbit, and acting in accordance with combined demands of plot, character and theme. 
Hazel's plan to draw out the nut hanger farm dog has already stretched the bounds of plausible rabbit behavior. So allowing him to escape the cat would obliterate those bounds. Either Hazel dies now or their ex machina must be deployed. And there are several reasons why Hazel cannot yet die. Now, not least because my eight year old self reading the book would have recognized the injustice of it um, and thrown the book to the wall. Adams had already kept me waiting through 20 pages of dread anticipation, uh, anticipation since the cat first caught Hazel. And I hadn't held my breath all that time to see Hazel die now. Furthermore, Hazel is necessary to the ongoing success of the rabbit community he has been building. And Hazel must live to see this come to fruition as biotic community in Leopold's terms. So, and back to the point I'm making here, following this logic, Lucy could be considered no more than a device to resolve a narrative impasse. But Lucy is much more important than the invocation of Dea Ex Machina might suggest. Lucy is a female working class child who has potential beyond the circumstances of her farmyard upbringing. And there is much more that could be said here about gender, education and class. Lucy is the child who brings Hazel into direct contact with humans. And it matters that it is she who brings this about. Lucy sees Hazel in ways that her father cannot and brings about a connection between human and rabbit, however brief, that is like any other in the book. It also matters where this interaction takes place. It is important that, in her father's words, she didn't let him go on the place. He's referring to Hazel there. That is, Lucy must not set Hazel free on Nuthanger Farm. Lucy must take Hazel away from the reach of agrarian and domestic human life for him to survive, for him to continue to be the wild rabbit that he is. And so Dr. Adams offers to take Lucy with him on his rounds and up onto the down to set Hazel free. And in this moment, rabbit and child occupy an experience and a space of liberation that unites them. The ridge between Hare Warren Down and Watership Down is a liminal space between downlands, between Georgic dwelling and rabbit warren, between life and death, between human and non-human being. And its liminal status is crucial in confirming once and for all the possibility of biosphere. The glimpse of human life in one short chapter reminds the reader of the humanist impulse of anthropomorphism. The farm space is quickly rejected as a space for Hazel to be, and the glimpse of human life is still, still is sorry is soon over. Yet it lingers. A human and rabbit move into a shared space of possibility, an idea that I don't have time to develop here, but it links to Lucy's future beyond the farm, as well as confirming the, the necessity of Hazel's survival. In Hazel Comes Home, the next chapter, the narrative return to the rabbit's world is jarring, as human and non-human experience are almost clumsily and purposefully juxtaposed. When Hazel returns to his, uh, to his friends, he is for a moment just another rabbit. He is any rabbit and all potential rabbits before Pipkin and Fiverr identified him as Hazel once more. And I, I quote from the book, I don't have a slide for this. They saw a rabbit approaching over the high ground to the west. They both ran nearer and recognized Hazel. Hazel comes into being via the landscape through which he moves. Hazel goes on to explain that a man brought me back in Hrududu, a claim greeted with derision by Bigwig. In this moment, human and non-human experience are simultaneously dislocated and merged. And it's this oscillation made possible by shared liminal space that opens up the grounds of uh, the grounds of anthropomorphism too biosphere. And I'm going to move on now to a second example that takes me away um, from Watership Down, 
But moves me on to Richard Adams' biography, and I have an, a, a slide for this, uh, The Day Gone By. Um, and this allows me to demonstrate that his anthropomorphism is part of a wider tradition of writing that repeatedly throws up liminal spaces in which human and non-human being is worked out. Um, so I'm going to read an extract during which Adams describes his childhood home. There were three acres of land altogether and a gardener's cottage which had its own small garden. The superb view to the south was across the open country of ploughland meadows and copses typical of the Berkshire Hampshire border, stretching away four or five miles to the distant line of the Hampshire Downs. <coughs> the steep escarpment formed by Cottington's Hill, Cannon Heath Down, Watership Down and Ladle Hill. To the east lay a little copse known as the Wild Wood and beyond that the drying ground with its clothesline and rough grass, among which lay the netted raspberry bed and a broken down disused pigsty. Just to the north of these lay Bull Banks, and he has in, in, in uh, brackets here, Beatrix Potter, the tale of Mr. Todd. Bull Banks was an actual bank of considerable size, perhaps 25 yards long, five feet high and 10 broad, planted with laurel, forsythia, cydonia, lilac and other shrubs, and crowned along the top with three silver birches. In front of it, outside the dining room windows, lay the rose garden, and behind it, the potting shed, a vegetable patch, and the sizable stables. Here was a place and a half. In Bull Banks, you could go to ground, and no one could tell where you might be. It could represent anything, a fortress, the council rooms of a kingdom, a series of caves or dwellings, a dangerous jungle. But reality was often more delightful than pretending. Thrushes, blackbirds and chaffinches nested in bull banks. A small child lying still among the bushes was better placed to watch them than an adult. There were two great clumps of rhododendrons, one red and one mauve. When I was small, these affected me more deeply than any other flowers in the garden, more even than the roses and the dwarf begonias. I can remember once, uh, after a shower of rain, standing on tiptoe and thrusting my head and shoulders up through the dripping branches and foliage to come face to face with a great cluster of blooms, covered with drops, glowing fresh, their brilliantly coloured trumpet mouths, all maculate within, the whole bigger than my own face. In early childhood, I believe, awareness works on two levels at once. There is a paradox. Wonderful things are often apprehended composedly. After all, they're tangibly there. While ordinary things can seem miraculous in a way in which they never do again. I remember feeling soaking wet, including my feet, which I hated, and at the same time recognizing a kind of abasement before the rhododendrons. That is, there was nothing I could do adequately to respond to something so beautiful. They were beyond they were beautiful beyond comprehension, beyond assimilation. You would never be able to say, well, now I've seen them. You felt you ought to look at them forever. They were beyond anything one could have expected or imagined. Saying even this much is really cheating, bringing in hindsight and words to try to express a child's incoherent, inarticulate sense of being utterly bowled over. And I'm end of quotation there. There is a sense of childly being that almost inhales space in the natural world. This is a moment in which human being is shaped by strong landscape, but also one that is informed by anthropomorphic literature that understands the importance of biosphere in the terms I've started to describe. Bull Banks is a real space of Adam's childhood experience, yet infused with the fantastic and naturalistic regions of Beatrix Potter's books the tale of Mr. Todd in particular, and also the wind in the willows as per the reference to the wild wood. When I spoke to Richard Adams about this during an interview, he said that the Bull Banks reference was entirely caught up in his admiration for Beatrix Potter and her work. Adams did not aspire to the high level anthropomorphism of, bit of Potter's tales. He looked to Kipling for the model of anthropomorphism deployed in Watership Down. 
But Potter's books surely inform Adam's negotiation of space on that liminal ridge in Watership Down. And now I move on to my final and, and, and brief um, last example, my final and, and brief example um, from uh, Beatrix Potter and Mr. Todd. And I have another slide for this. Um, I think there's a map that comes next. Thank you. And so very briefly, I offer you a glimpse of Potter's Bullbanks and the tale of Mr. Todd published in 1912. As Potter explains in the opening paragraph, this is a story about two disagreeable people called Tommy Brock and Mr. Todd. That disagree disagreeability is coded in moral terms, and yet it also has ontological reach, as it is played out in liminal sm space that moves between human domestic dwelling and non-human habitats of the natural world. To be human or non-human is in part a matter of where and how beings live. Bullbanks is the sometime dwelling place, place of Mr. Todd. And I'm quoting uh, from Potter here. In winter and early spring, he might generally be found in an earth amongst the rocks at the top of Bullbanks under Oatmeal Crag. This earthy territory is tied up with the disagree disagreeability Potter identifies at the outset. Oatmeal Crag uh, and Bull Banks, as you can see on the map here, are real places mapped on Ordnance Survey, as Watership Down is, of course. And this invocation of mapped landscape plays a part in reframing Todd and Brock's human status, along with the conditions of civilization. And there's, there's one more slide um, which, which shows the sort of views and landscape Potter's investing in. This is a view across Estuary Water and um, Bull Banks is, is part of that view. Now, I don't have time to demonstrate fully um, the way these map landscapes play a part in reframing Todd and Brock's human status. Um, but it's all confirmed by the disagreement, the terrific battle at the end of the book that marks Fox and Badger's final encounter, during which any pretense of human or social propriety falls away. And I can you can move on to the final slide there. And I, and I quote, then the snarling and worrying went on outside and they rolled over the bank and downhill bumping over the rocks. Bull Banks is a strong landscape that simultaneously characterizes Mr. Todd and Tommy Brock, undoing pretensions of humanity and rendering them wild beings. This eco-ontological maneuver from, from domestic dwelling to wild habitat allows for their status as human and non-human creatures. On these terms, Bull Banks functions as liminal space that forms an extensive ridge of anthropomorphic development, reaching from Potter to Adams and from Oatmeal Crag to Watership Down. In these examples, I've roughly sketched mechanisms through which anthropomorphic children's literature opens pockets of biotic community, in which human and non-human being can coexist in eco-ontological space. These pockets are not stable, nor are they consistent, but there is space opened up beyond the dominance of human being in these anthropomorphic texts. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. What a thought-provoking talk on Watership Down's place in the context of other examples of anthropomorphic literature through a contemporary understanding of human and non-human experience. Thanks so much, Lisa and all our guest speakers tonight. And for the second part of our book talk, um, I'd like to hand over now to our esteemed author of Cardiff Book Talk's blog, Colin Bond, <laughs> who's kindly offered to curate questions from our audience, who I'm sure are busily writing now, I hope, at least. Well, over to you, to you, Colin. Yeah, thank, thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, it's, it's some really brilliant talks, really, really um, stimulating. I'm. I, I, one of the things that I love about the book is that the, uh, the rabbits have their own language. Um, I love the fact that they call a tractor a hrududu um, because that suggests to me that their language can evolve. You know, they wouldn't have, they've, they've only recently named the tractor a hrududu because it wouldn't have existed, you know, in El Herrera's time perhaps. 
And I wondered what the speakers thought about the rabbit's encounter with the, the way the book depicts the rabbit's encounters with human technology um, in the story. Selfishly, I always get to ask my own question first. So sorry, everyone. Let's have some questions in the Q&A box at the bottom while, um, while uh, our speakers answer. Is that, does anyone have a, a, any thoughts on this ready? Catherine? I have, one, I have one brief thought about it, which I sort of alluded to in my talk towards the end which is uh, that my reading of rabbit society, as depicted in Watership Town, I have no idea about the real one, uh, <laughs> is that uh, they don't really have a very distinct idea of the historical past. So they're, they're, amongst all the many stories they're passing down, they're not passing down about stories about times before tractors existed, when it used to be, you know, oxen or horses uh, putting plows. Um, in their myths about um, El Aracha, I just can't say that name, um, the prince guy, um, machinery already exists. So it's, it's not, it's, it's not taking place in some kind of you know, equivalent of the Bronze Age for rabbits. In their conception, the world that they're picturing is very much like the world that they see around them. And this is, um, you know, this is very understandable because those myths are not just there for entertainment. They're there to be useful and to be inspiring and to say, well, when you come across situations like this, this is what you ought to do. And of course, if you're describing a landscape that's totally unlike one that you can see around you that won't be a very helpful story so i think any particular generation of rabbits is simply sort of accepting the world as they see it um and uh, but 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 of course you're you're absolutely right there would have been a time when the word do 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 came into existence or was perhaps potentially sort of repurposed from some former meaning that it might have had for some structurally equivalent thing but i suspect from that particular word that there's an onomatopoeic element to it amazing uh Dimitra, did you have a oh lisa do you want to go first yeah. or just you oh i don't I, I, I go, we... go ahead go ahead <laughs> okay. and then i'll follow it's fine i mean for me the, the the point we stop and sort of talk about this uh question with my students is and that is completely related to the fruit to do is the the point where they first face the road and that is such a memorable <laughs> such a memorable scene because it's like a river but it's not a river it doesn't move and it's got that weird color and it smells strange and what is going on on there you know it, it's dangerous but it's only dangerous under certain conditions and the fruit to do itself is dangerous under certain conditions it doesn't seem to have any sort of uh yeah, it's not a it's not a predator in the way that the the rabbits understand. So it's 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 very alien. But at the same time, what the text does is is it 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 gets us to reconsider human technology from the perspective of the rabbit, which is um it's a really really tricky thing to do, and it it does it very well. It takes us down to the level of the ground, right, of of the road, um and and uh, you know we we never given the actual translation of fruit to do, but we all make sense of it. You know, in one one way or another, the the you know the the squashed hedgehog, the the lights flashing, you know, this idea that um, human technology and human human humanity more generally is indifferent. It's not a predator in the way that the foxes, or for example, for example, other animals, animals. It's just indifferent. You know, as as um, they say later on, you know, they try to rationalize what happened to the world. We were just in the way. You know, there was there was no other reason. There's no moral you know reason why we were we were persecuted. We were just in the way. And, and there's something, you know, my students always, always stop and, and talk about that, that moment as um, a point where, you know, it, it really does get you to, you know, it's a jolt, isn't it? It gets you to think about, about ourselves in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I was, yes, I, I was going to say something similar and, and bring us back usefully to that, that, um, that bit that Kathy um, quoted um uh, around the the river crossing and, and i think really you see in action adam's trying to show us what the the thing that we can't possibly know what it is that rob rabbits think and how they absolutely cannot understand what they're being confronted with and um it was one of the things when i 
I alluded to the fact that I interviewed Richard Adams, which was one of the yeah my, my yeah luckiest moments um, um, in my experience, I think. Uh, but we we were talking about managing anthropomorphism, and he said that he felt that the what he felt he was fairly true to what ro rabbit, rabbits could potentially do, except for the moment actually not that rob, rabbit crossing, but later on when they have to escape um and make it down the river he felt that that was really stretching the bounds of anthropomorphism and he felt there he was serving narrative and plot rather than the conditions of of being rabbit being but that has i think i've i've kind of pondered over that subsequently um and i'm really interested like Dimitri, in, in those moments where you really see him working at you know how do i convey both what it is that rabbits might be you know uh thinking or considering and how do i convey that to my human audience and, and not make it seem too labored i think they're fascinating moments in the book it's done really deftly isn't it the way that mm. he notices that something floats and then yeah connects the boat later yeah yeah i i wondered how plausible or or but it's it's clever it, it, it kind of works yeah. for I think. Um, another question um, in the chat from Roger. Um, hi, Roger. Thanks for your question. This was uh, put in during um, Catherine's talk um, on the subject of Beatrice Potter. But I guess, I mean, it applies sort of equally to, um, you know, Adams's intentions with, with Watership Down. Maybe we can, you know, open, open up the question a bit more. But he asked, do you suppose that Beatrice Potter had the dichotomies that you describe um, in any way in her mind, or was she just writing a story? Um, uh, well, uh, I think we could, of course, I don't know what was exactly was in Beatrix Potter's mind, or, and certainly not what was consciously in her mind, but I think in some sense she must have had these dichotomies um, in her mind because she makes a good deal of use of them, not just in Peter Rabbit, but takes something like the tale of Jemima Puddle Duck, for example. Um, there she's got the, you know, Jemima Puddle Duck, who's obviously a duck, um, encountering a, a gentleman reading a newspaper with sandy whiskers, um, who I think once described as foxy, but never actually described as a fox. Although, of course, we can see from the illustrations that that's exactly what he is. And she's kind of working on this kind of dual narrative one in the words that are written down and one in the pictures that accompany these words and the the possibility of misinterpretation that sort of lies between those two in the fuddled mind of the protagonist um, is something that she's clearly you know very deliberately working on um readers can see that he's a fox and we may be you know, Im imploring Jemima to see that as well, but perhaps um, she doesn't, uh, well, so of course she does actually survive, but um, she, she doesn't see it as, as soon as we, one would like. Um, and, you know, that possibility of taking the fox either as a gentleman reading a newspaper or as, a, or as an actual fox who likes to eat ducks, is there and of course you know it's, it's, it's not something Beatrix Potter invented it goes all the way back to um you know uh, Red Riding Hood you know is the wolf a wolf or is it a sort of charming young man offering uh you know, conversation in the forest yeah go on Lisa please yeah I I I, I hope you don't mind me following that um um like Kathy, I can't presume to uh, know what was in Beatrice Potter's mind, but I'm sure of lots of uh, lots of us here know. I mean, she's a really accomplished botanist, um, but also a keen observer of human manners, um, social condition. You know, lots of people have, you know, called her book, compared her books to kind of Jane Austen, um, but you know, using anthropomorphism, she's acutely aware of how animals work sort of inside and out. She observes them minutely, um, but she also observes human behavior. And I just can't believe that she wouldn't be uh, reflecting on those relationships, uh, given the minute, de the minute detail of her books, in which all of that is pl played out. I just can't believe it's accidental, really. So I agree with uh, Kathy there on that. 
Um, what, what do we think I mean, about Adams's own sort of perspective on writing? Because he says again and again in interview after interview, like it's just a story that is told to kids in the car. And yet it's 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 full of all of these sort of profound passages that talk about stories and the power of stories. And, you know, what what do we really think are his intentions? I mean, it, it is a story that it's told to children in a car, but at the same time, it's a story he knew already. This is, in, in, in so many ways, what Ship Down is, is a retelling of, you know, epic stories. It is an, it is an Aeneid, really, isn't it? It's an Aeneid with bunnies, as uh, uh, Kids Johnson said very, very uh, accurately a while ago. And, and it's interesting that, you know, how it comes out of his, you know, his education, the sort of stories that you would have known as a child, the sort of story that would come up as, something that can easily be appropriated and sort of used in that way when you have children, you know, the necessity of having children in the, the, in the car and having to entertain them. Um, and and I, I don't know how much of that is, you know, it, we don't know enough about how exactly the story was at the beginning, because obviously the oral story that the, that the girls heard was quite different to the much more, you know, elegant, uh, uh, um, yeah, refined sort of writing that we get in, in the written version. Uh, but, but these are sort of unlikely bedmates aren't they you know the, the Aeneid with bunnies but it works it really, <laughs> really works it had, you know the structures of the the adventure story the structures of the story that many of us sort of know unconsciously as well work here very very, very well I don't mm -hmm. know if I've answered but please Lisa uh, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, in, you know, A Day Gone By, it's really, really clear that, that Adams is a storyteller from, you know, <laughs> from birth, pretty much. It, it's what he does. He tells stories. Um, so as Demetra said, he was telling that story before he told it to his girls. Um, writing it down was a very different process. But it, he he knew what my background was. Um, and when I met him, he was very, very keen to stress that um, this was not, he did not consider this um, a work of children's literature. Now, that's not to say he was denying, by the way, the field of children's literature or children's writers. And he was also keen to point that out. But he felt that to um, for, it, for only to be recognised as a book for children was deeply problematic in that it is he saw it as so much more than that. But through this vehicle of anthropomorphism that he he felt, you know, it, Kipling, he, he held up as the kind of ultimate example for him of what was possible. He felt that you could do so much through that mechanism. Um, and that, it seems to be, was one of the starting points for it anyway. I'd try to express what he'd just been through during war and, um, you know, mm. a, a literary form through which he could get in touch with really profound ideas and, and human experiences, as well as, you know, engaging with that environment. It very much reminds me of one of those war films where the platoon is sort of, you know, mm. traveling into enemy yeah. territory or something. And it, so there's that genre that he's sort of borrowing as well. Mm. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. We're coming yeah. up to eight thirty. We're going to need. To, oh, sorry, Susan. I was going to agree with you there and, and and ask a question if there's time, but there doesn't seem to be on gender. Well, but because it's a very it's a story for me about male bonding and looking after one another, looking after each other while protecting each other from the common enemy. And there's that sense of care as well as um, strength in numbers. Um, that really comes through and um, a male story for me, mm. very much so. I didn't know if it was for others. Mm. Yeah, he, it, it's interesting that because he, there was criticism about that, about the the, uh, the sort of gender balance in the novel. E even then, you know, I think it's much more obvious to us today, again, thinking about how my students react to it. I always get that question mm. also debated <laughs> in class. Um, and he try, he actually tried to have a go at rectifying that by uh, so so you get a little you get more um, first of all you do get you know of course you get very very active female characters here but you get the continuation uh, of what happens you know after the book entails from what shipped down and there he seems to be thinking more widely about 
why should only the male, male rabbits be in leadership positions, for example? Mm -hmm. And he does something to rectify that. You know, he has a warrant that's run by a uh, by female uh, um, rabbit. He has a partnership between a male and a female rabbit as well. But he was very conscious of that, I think. Uh, and I suppose in some ways it is the initial narrative that's being retold here, which is a very a narrative from a, an older time and a, a narrative that is a war, you know, band of brothers, sort of mm -hmm. a war narrative in many ways. Um, but yeah, I think that bothered you actually <laughs> later on. And there was an, at least an attempt to respond. We had a lovely um, paper in uh, the conference that Kathy and I uh, organized and watched it down exactly on that sort of, uh, on that question. Yeah, I would I would echo that. The Tales of Watership Down was, I think, in, in many ways, self-consciously an attempt to kind of row back on the, um, you know, quite heavy, <laughs> male focus of, of of the original book which is not only the Aeneid but also the rape of the Sabine women as far as the Absolutely. second half is concerned um and you know I, I think you know, it, it's uh, whether it's, it's not as successful a book artistically or let alone commercially as Watership Down but it's you know I, I do respect it in a way if, I think if, if, if a few years ago Demetra and I did a book talk about the um uh, see the Queen's Earth Sea stories, and in a sense, we could see tales from Watership Down as um, Richard Adams' version of Tehanu, I think, as a kind of almost a palinode, a kind of way of sort of saying, Yes, I left something out or got something slightly wrong, and in the light of 20, 25 years' experience, I want to just set the record straight. Yeah, and he, I mean, he he actually said to me, you should be taking me to task for that aspect of Watership Down. You know, who have you read those reviews? And they're right, you know, um, and and then talked about Tales of Watership Down. We, I, I'm not sure it's quite the full resolution that Adams wants it to be, but absolutely that, uh, um, I agree with Dimitri and Cathy there, that, that expectation underwrites it, doesn't it? That he, that it's a response, and that he recognises that there was something, as you say, that either was kind of left out or he didn't quite see. I noticed um, that there were some questions in the Q and A. I never noticed the Q and A box. Yes, so we have a question um, from Elizabeth, which I think leads um, quite mm. on from what we're just talking. She <laughs> asks about Lucy. Um, and she says, could the Lucy character have been anything other than female and working class? And so I, I guess it's a question about how, you know, why, why has he chosen this sort of character and, and, and how could it be otherwise? Um, does anyone want to take that one on, Lisa? Are you... I, mean, I mean, quite possibly it could have been otherwise, but I think it's so interesting that it's not in, in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I can say that for a young child reading this book, it was absolutely crucial that Lucy was there. You know, I, I read this book and I hated humans. Um, you know, how do you get out of that as an eight year old? You know, kind of. Um, but Lucy was my get out um, because here was a, a young girl, relatively powerless, it seems, in that we get this glimpse of her in a by the way, shockingly um, written scene at the level of class, the um, the accent Adams gives his characters um, is sort of appalling, really. Um, but it's quite difficult to read. As I was reading it back today and trying to read it out loud, I thought, no, I'm not going to try to imitate what he was trying to approximate there. So there are problems with that depiction. But I think it's hugely important that that, that, that whole scene is, is about conditions of or potential for escaping something. Um, the conditions into which you've been born. So there could he could there could have been other characters, but I think it's hugely important that you know there haven't been that we've already talked about the fact that you know this is a this is a kind of sort of boy's own adventure. And Lucy stands out in that respect. Um, she is something else and offers something different to Hazel in that moment. And for me, that's why she's so important. But I'm sure the others might want to respond to that. No, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I, I, I'd only add that in the context of 1972, having, um, well, I mean, she's a minor character within the context of the entire book, but the main human character, the working class, is fairly unusual even then. And especially considering that Adams was absolutely very, very much upper middle class himself, I think, you know, it's. It, it redounds to his credit that he was you know, not not 
he wasn't content to have Hazel found by you know, the local doctor's daughter or, or, or the vicar's daughter or something like that, which would have been standard fare for 1972. Um, uh, but you know, he, he, he much more realistically just made her the daughter on, on, on the farm. I mean, I've always wondered if he follows in the footsteps of uh, Williamson in Tarka the Otter, who has a, another, it's a small, a young girl observing Tarka, and she's with the hunt, but she doesn't give Tarka away. And again, that's my moment of salvation in this book, mm. you know, the kind of reprieve for humanity. Um, and it's going to be a young girl like me who, you know, saves all the animals. <laughs> I was on a crusade from that point on. <laughs> Yeah, there seems to be an accumulation of sort of gradations of powerlessness here, really, right? Gender and class and everything. Um, but but again, there's a comparison there with the plight of the rabbits at that particular point. And still, the humanity still has more agency at that particular point. Mm. Mm. But yeah, we're overrunning a little bit, but we do have one more question, if everyone's sort of willing to go for it. Um, mm. So Samuel um, has asked, what do the speakers think regarding Cowslip's Warren being characteristic of a cult? Um, and it continues, is there a class element to the Warren as suggested in the second talk? Are there cult-like tendencies perhaps echoing some facet of our society? Mm. I mean, I, I, I love the Cowslip's Warren episode it's just it's brilliant it's such a great satire on it, it, society and our modern world and but absolutely that's, that's what 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 do you think Dimitri you... I think there is an element there is an element of that there is an element of a cult and actually the BBC animated adaptation yeah 2000 and gosh uh 2015 maybe somewhere there there was a BBC a series to three episode adaptation um, they actually portrayed the rabbits sort of worshipping some sort of crystals, which is interesting, again, as a choice, you know, in, in, in having that sort of religious aspect to it. So it seems to be, it seems like there, you know, it, it, that, that um, Silverweed's poetry is a sort of, is a sort of su bad substitute to, you know, a rotten substitute to the actual, you know, thorough fair, you know, the proper fair of uh, uh, myth and legend and folktale, which is the more wholesome um, um, sort of yeah, mental or, or sort of uh, survival nutrition there uh, for the rabbits, um, and and that and and I suppose it, you know could we think about poetry as a cult? Could we think about sort of a, a particular worship of a particular type of you know of privileging a particular type of art um, in a certain way? I don't know. I think poetry is a quite apt choice there for mm -hmm. that sort of little you know uh, in in joke to be to be played potentially. Yeah, there's definitely uh, uh, beyond the cult aspects, which are certainly present. You know, there's also definitely a, a, an element of satire about sort of Radio Four front row talking about the latest exhibition, <laughs> <laughs> the aestheticization of everything. Um, uh, you know, Adams wasn't the first person to do it, but he does it very well. Uh, there, I'm doing it just then when I said that. I'm stepping back, aren't I? And sort of saying, oh, I'm comparing the way he does it with the way other people do it. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's doing both of those things. But in a way, I think what's so powerful for that, to me, about that cow step episode is it's actually quite hard to sort of put your finger on. Um, you can't easily say, oh, you know, this cow slip is a, uh, and, you know, and, and the Warren is. Uh, evil um or, you know they're uh, they're not necessarily out to kill uh hazel and co um you know, or, or be so very angry. indifferent to their death but they're indifferent to their own death so yeah. it, it's 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 slightly sort of it puts you off balance i think if you're trying to read this oh. and you have been re reading this as a kind of straightforward daring to adventure so, so suddenly the stakes are changed slightly it's very um, weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. something uncanny about Cal Slip and his, yeah. his friends. Yeah. Yeah, push you off balance, I think. Yeah. yeah and rabbit like they are. Are they within rabbitry? Sorry, I'm making up words now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Lisa? Or should we? 
I mean, not not really. I just I, I was thinking just in, in terms of the, the absolute blind commitment uh, to that way of life. That's that that question about, you know, characterizing a cult, just that, you know, no, no interest in any other alternatives. Um, and, and that's what's so frightening about it really because the whole because the whole book it for me it, it is about there there is a curiosity in that book about finding out whether there is another way and other way to live and it's that absolute lack of curiosity that's just unnerving um in mm. in that whole sequence well, it's they've, they've been given you know everything yeah. they think they need haven't they it's oh and you've just reminded me i was walking okay locally i was walking on um our tie, which is called common land, it's common land anyway. There is a there is a rabbit run that stretches down the whole of the 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 tie, and I I'm lucky enough each morning to see kind of rabbits on the on the the downs, and someone had walked along the length of the the tie, and outside each of the 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 burrows or lots of the burrows, they had laid a carrot. And I honestly, I was, and they probably thought this was a wonderfully generous thing to do, but I just thought. How sleeps Warren? What tragedy should I pick up all of these carrots? So there we are, living out, watership down in my daily life, <laughs> dog walking. Oh dear. Brilliant. I, that is possibly a good note to end on. Um, <laughs> I would like, like to top that. Thank all of our speakers for coming along tonight. Um, do, do we have any sort of final thoughts to add, Susan? Or should I just sort of um, thank everyone and say good night here? I think we are muted. Uh, Susan's muted. That's okay. Um, thanks everyone for coming. It, it's it's as always an absolute um, pleasure and a hoot to to have the chance to do this. We hope to see you for the next one. Um, please follow us on Twitter and uh, keep an eye on the blog if you want further updates um, for what we're planning. We do have a couple of things um, that we can't can't quite announce just yet. Um, and uh, if uh, keep an eye on your emails as well, because you may well uh, find that you get a little message from us asking for audience feedback. Um, no pressure, but if you can fill those out and get them back to us, that is uh, really super helpful um, in terms of us planning um, our next events. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you have anything you want to um, add, Susan? No, I was just going to pretend to be Roy Plumley and say goodbye, everyone. <laughs>